Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this Technology and Learning Conference at Pepperdine University. My name is Jerry Flynn. I'm the Director of Technology and Learning at, at Pepperdine University. And my group is a component of the IT department here at Pepperdine. And we work with faculty of all five schools of, uh, of the university at all the campuses uh, and do three things. We, we learn what you teach, how you teach, and if you come to us and say, hey, is there a technology, an educational technology that, that could help me in my teaching, enhanced learning, uh, we do some research and, and, and uh, collaborate with you. Uh, for that matter, sometimes we ride in your coattails. I mean, at, at the Graduate School of Education and Psychology, they've been teaching how to teach with technology for decades, and so uh, we, we find out what are the best practices. And that leads us to our second uh, mission, is then to um, research what works and what doesn't. We often pilot test different technologies and, and teaching methods. Um, and then, given that something is viable and works, is a good idea, we promote those teaching practices or that technology across the university. Now, um, what, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is give you a little genesis for uh, the background for this conference, tell you about the logistics of where you're going to go today and, and, and what you might hear, and then introduce our keynote speaker. So. Um, let me give you a little bit of that, that background. As I indicated, my, uh, my staff and I, and many of you know, Alan Regan and Hong Ka and Mark Giglioni and, and recently Landon Phillips, who have um, uh, been, been working with faculty all five schools. Um, but um, we, um, every time we, we work with faculty, what we, what we frequently hear is, hey, Jerry, I don't want a sales job. I don't want, hey, technology is the panacea. I, you should use it all the time. Um, rather, and quite frankly, I don't even want to hear it from you. I'd like to uh, um, uh, meet with colleagues and find out the unvarnished truth of what works and what doesn't. And so today, while this conference is indeed hosted by information technology, it is presented by the faculty of Pepperdine U University. It's for the faculty, by the faculty. And what you will hear today is a, a faculty showcase of the good, the bad, and ugly from colleagues across the university. And I'm very grateful for all of you attending, and I'm deeply indebted to your colleagues, uh, this group of speakers who will be speaking today. I'll mention them briefly and introduce them. Um, uh, but I'd like to begin with some logistics. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? In the bag that uh, you received when, when you checked in, you should have a program guide, and it details the various presentations and the rooms that they're in. Now, ostensibly, when you registered, you kind of pre-registered for a couple uh, sessions. Uh, whether or not you, you remember those, we sent you a reminder, but you're free to go to any of them. But to make it easy for you, um, there's basically three places that, that you can go today, OK? The first is the blue room. If you're feeling a little down, we'll <laughs> No, it's, um, the, the Blue Room is the Executive Dining Center, for those of you familiar with, with Drescher. Uh, it's, it's the Executive Dining ce Center. And there's three things that will occur there today that may interest you. The first, at 925, um, two mathematics professors from Seaver College, Tim Lucas and Brian Fisher, will be detailing their experience using iPads and whether or not that fostered social interaction in a math class. And for those of you not familiar, for the past um, three, three semesters, uh, we have been conducting an iPad research study. And professors will use iPads in one class and teach the same class without it and see if uh, it enhanced learning. And so you may be interested in attending that session in the Blue Room to hear how professors Lucas and, and Fisher uh, fared in, the, in that endeavor. Um, at, at Professor Cheryl Corrado, who teaches history at Seaver, will talk about her experience using courses, which is our learning management system at Pepperdine. Many of you uh, know it as Sakai. It's powered by Sakai, the open source learning management system. And Professor Corrado um, teaches something like 200 students with courses. And it, of anyone I know at the university use it, use it more efficiently and more robustly and tells us the good, the bad, and the ugly, what works and what doesn't. And so um, you might find that of, of interest. Uh, and, you know, the average professor might teach 20 people. She teaches 200 and does it very, very effectively. So you, you, uh, you may be interested in attending that in the Blue Room. And then the third thing in the Blue Room I think everybody would be interested in is lunch at 1245. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's a free lunch here at Drescher. And um, 
And those are the three things that will be occurring in the blue room. Now, in the orange room, so-called because of its orangish hue, this is the, the auditorium that you're in right now. And there's a, a number of, of speeches occurring here. Uh, momentarily, will be the, the keynote speech. Um, but following that, at, uh, at 9.25, Professor Susan Helm of Seaver College also participated in the iPad research study. Um, and she's going to be talking about her experience transitioning from lecturer to facilitator. In her experience, she actually changed the way that she teaches. Uh, and so you may find that uh, uh, to be of interest, and that's in, in this room. Following Professor Corrado uh, is Professor Greg McNeil of the School of Law, who uses uh, what are called clickers, these response systems, these devices about the size of remote control that's, that he uh, uses to get a pulse on, on student uh, retention and understanding. Um, and it's an immediate response on whether or not they understand the, uh, the content that he's delivering. And then following 1.30, in the closing session, everyone will come back into this room um, to hear from Dr. Spring Cook and Dr. Bob McQuaid. Uh, Professor Cook teaches at the Graduate School of Education and Psychology, and, and, and Dr. McQuaid is at the, the Grazia School of Business and Management. And they're going to be talking about identifying affecting teaching practices. The truth is, technology and learning is somewhat of a misnomer, right? I mean, at this day and age, everybody uses technology in some regard to do your research or to synthesize the data or to present it, don't we? Really, it's the learning piece that do any of these things mean anything to the students? Does it enhance teaching? And, and they're going to try to crack that nut and talk about what works and, and what doesn't in their experience. So. Logistically, then, you're either in this room for the keynote and the closing, you will be, and then you have the opportunity of remaining in here or going to the Blue Room. And please join us in the Blue Room for lunch, at which time we'll be unveiling prizes. And you may win uh, a flip cam or an iPad. So please, um, please join us for lunch. Now, the third place that you can go today is the hands-on session. And this is a breakout session about midway through it at, uh, at uh, 11 o'clock, 11.05. Um, although you can go there anytime. And in it, we have our educational technology partners. And these are educational technology vendors that we work with that uh, provide some of the technology and some of the sessions. And so if something piques your interest, so for example, um, some of the, your, your colleagues have been using iPads, well, Apple will be represented. And you can go and, and learn more about, about that. If Professor Corrado does something exciting in, in, uh, in courses, Sakai. Longsight is our hosting vendor, and you can ask more information. Uh, you can perhaps ask them what's emerging, what's coming down the pike in that system, or even make recommendations. Why don't we change this? We have made a number of changes because of faculty recommendations, and we're grateful to you for that. Uh, as well, Google will be represented. Many of you use Google Docs and, and the other applications. Either yourself or your students do. I don't know if you're aware, but they can easily put up a form if they're doing research. And, and get quantitative data and analyze the results very easily online. Um, remember Professor McNeil from the School of Law using those clickers? Turning Technologies is the ones who provides those. And if that is something that's, that's of interest, you might go and say, hey, you know, I don't teach law, but in my discipline, how might I use those? What types of questions? And you could have those addressed. Now, Cisco provides um, <clears throat> a number of services. Some of you have what is called voice over IP, and all of us will in a year's time. And this allows you to receive phone calls on, on your computer. So you can have your computer at home, and people call your, your work phone, and you pick it up at home. As well, they provide uh, a type of, of web conferencing called uh, Meeting Place. And so if, if these are of interest to you, you can find out what is available now or what is soon coming. And then finally, Illuminate, many of you use, is a, a web conferencing tool that allows you to uh, teach distance classes, to hold online uh, office hours, to, to have faculty uh, meetings online, virtually. And so all of these vendor partners will be with us today. And if something is of interest that you hear or you want to ask questions about what's coming down the pike, these would be the people to speak with. Now, as well, as well, there's a computer lab. And by the way, uh, IT personnel, Pepperdine IT personnel, will be in these rooms 
to let you know, you know, specifically at Pepperdine, this is what is available now, and, and set, et cetera. But there's also a, comp a computer lab that if you literally want to get your hands on something and start reconfiguring courses, I, I learned that I could rename my classes or add tools or change the gradebook. Uh, IT personnel will be there with you and, and you can log in and if it's something relatively quick or easy, we can do it right away. And if it's something that's longer, we'll have an initial discussion, maybe schedule a follow-up. Um, if you want to try an Illuminate session and do some uh, web conferencing, that is your opportunity in the hands-on room. So as you see, in that hands-on session, there's an opportunity to actually put into practice what you've heard others use. Now, I'm very excited to announce that I mentioned the iP iPad study a number of times, and it is coming to its conclusion. This is the third semester, and uh, uh, we're finalizing the results and so forth. But the iPads remain, and we've had a number of uh, professors come to us and say, hey, I'd like to use those. I wasn't in the study, but I'd like to use them. What are you doing with the iPads? Well, you should have received an email recently that said you have an opportunity to get your hands on one. And for, it's a great benefit for those attending the conference today. Um, if you go to the, the iPad booth, our, our personnel, Dana Hoover and, and, and Janet Valencia in the back, have a limited number, the first come, first serve, where they'll, they'll loan them to you for the rest of the semester. And you can analyze it and the types of applications that you might teach in your discipline. And if you're interested in using them come the January semester, uh, they'll give you a paper application form that'll, that'll tell you the, the information that's, that's needed and then ask you to submit the online application. And, uh, and a handful of professors will be able to, to continue using the iPads for next semester and then you can keep your name in the hopper for, for subsequent semesters. So I'm very excited to announce that. And again, that will be in the vendor room at the, iPad, at the, uh, the Apple booth. So, three things to do today. Stay in this room, the orange room, for uh, a number of speeches, or go to the blue room for uh, a couple of speeches and lunch. And at any time, but during the hands-on session, you can go to the partners or the hands-on room and actually work with the technology that we're talking about. Now, enough about the logistics. Um, I'm, again, very, very grateful for, for everyone who's attended, who is attending today. I do understand that some people can't stay the entire time um, that, that's fine. What I ask you to do is in your handout, um, in your bag, look for this handout because subsequent to this speech throughout the, the, uh, um, the conference, we're going to discuss many ways that you can get involved and many resources that are available to you. Um, there's an, uh, an internet web website on the bottom. It's also on this big sign right here. I encourage you to, to opt in and we'll send you more information about the various things that perhaps you, you couldn't sit through all, all the uh, presentations above. So I thank you very much for attending. I hope that you enjoy the faculty showcase. I hope that you do get involved and, and, and look at that handout and, uh, and, and, and register your interest. And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, who doesn't require much introduction because we all know Provost Daryl Tippins. He has uh, been Provost of Pepperdine University for 10 years now. Uh, uh, is an English scholar and been teaching for more than 30 years. I'm very, very grateful and deeply indebted that, uh, that you're going to speak today. And, and please join me in welcoming Provost Tippins. Thank you, Jared. Good morning. This is a great idea. And I am so grateful to uh, you all for taking time to be here today. I know you have lots of things on your uh, plate and lots of uh, projects to take care of. But your willingness to take time out to uh, get better is uh, impressive, and I, I want to compliment you for uh, investing in, t in today. And obviously, I want to uh, thank the organizers of the conference. You can already tell this is a very well-organized event, and uh, an enormous amount of work has gone, in, uh, gone into it. And it's just one example of uh, what a great uh, IT team we have at this university. I keep being amazed at how attentive, thoughtful, organized uh, they are. Uh, in uh, August, a magazine came out called Te Technology Magazine, um, Campus Technology Magazine. And on the front of the magazine, they featured Pepperdine University. There was a national competition of, of university uh, IT uh, programs. And uh, we won an award. And you know some of those people in that picture. Uh, they're, they're just a great group of people. And uh, they're very attentive to uh, learning needs. And I have seen a real transition here at this university in my 10 years here. 
in terms of IT support for learning <coughs> for faculty needs. It's always been good. I don't want to say any, uh, you know, imply otherwise, but I just think it's been ramped up a great deal, a, a greater understanding that technology is in the service of learning. That's what they're here for. And you really get that spirit to, from the people in the IT area, and I just want to thank them for it. So many different people have been involved in uh, putting this uh, program together. And they keep thinking of new ways uh, to support what you want to do. Uh, we want to announce today um, a grant program that we are rolling out. Uh, we'll be giving out about $80,000 uh, to faculty for uh, technology learning projects, uh, seed funding for various uh, uh, interests that you may have as you propose new ways to integrate uh, learning and technology, uh, efforts to foster an environment that encourages uh, innovation, and uh, feasibility uh, uh, efforts for implementing successful campus-wide projects. So we're hoping that you will go out and try new things and that we can then disseminate what you do uh, to others. I hope you get a lot out of today's conference. Um, ultimately, I hope that you find ways to improve uh, student learning. We know that's why we're here. Maybe you'll find a way to reduce class time for routine elements that will then create more space for higher level learning. Uh, maybe you will learn, paradoxically, a way to make learning more personal uh, through the use of technology, uh, a better student experience, maybe increased efficiency of your own time. Now, some of you are here for uh, the same reason I'm here. We are, I have learned, there are people that, that run the help desk. So they have an acronym for people like me. You know, you call in for help. Uh, what they say to one another is that we have another picnic on the line. Have you ever heard this term? It's an acronym, and it stands for the problem is in the chair, not in the computer. <laughs> Picnic. <laughs> and I think they may have asked me to give the keynote because they knew I was a picnic, and this was their effort to convert me, and uh, I think it's actually working. Well, the, tr the problem of transition with computers and technology and with all forms of technology is not a new thing. It actually goes back through the centuries. If you think about the history of humankind, there's always this transition going on. If we used to do it this way or that way, and now we have to do it this way. And uh, I want to show you a little film that illustrates how this was a problem even back in the Middle Ages. I'm teaching medieval literature this semester, and this sort of tells the problem of uh, what was going on in England in the 12th century. Flott, 
Ikke sant? Nå er det sånn det. Nå får jeg ikke åpne den. Don't you feel better? We're in a great company here. <laughs> well, just for a few minutes, I thought I would give you uh, 10 reflections on, uh, on technology and learning. Uh, we are here about learning, and I teach. I love teaching. It's uh, still the best thing I get to do. And um, I thought for just a few minutes, I would give you 10 thoughts about what I think uh, we're about. And so the first one is simply this. Let's all admit it. We are all techies now. Uh, there really are no Luddites. It's just a myth that they exist. Uh, all Pepperdine faculty are into technology. It's, it's ubiquitous. And um, the question is simply not uh, technology, but which kind of technology. And I think to help us get there, um, and we have a little slide here to suggest, we're always moving on. So we, we started with the scroll. By the way, this changeover from scrolls, which were used for thousands of years, occurred at the time of Jesus. In the first century AD, the book started being developed. The Romans developed the, co the, the codex. And it took about three centuries for the book to fully displace the scroll. So by the third century, the codex became uh, operative. And we finally come along to things like you know, the iPad, the iPhone, et cetera. Uh, we keep moving on. Um, but I want to talk about technology for a moment in its broadest sense. Since I am also a professor of uh, language, I like to talk about words and their origin. And I think going back into the very root of the word technology, we can find something about what... Uh, technology comes from the Greek word techne. It means art, craft, practical skill. And uh, one of my messages for this session is remember that there is an artfulness at the core of true technology. Um, a, a builder, an artisan, a carpenter, a craftsman. Many of you grew up hearing that Jesus was a carpenter. Is not this the son of Joseph? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Actually, the Greek word there is tekton. Is not Jesus a techie? <laughs> um, that the idea is that he was a maker, an artisan of some sort. Now, if you're an artisan in wood, you call that person perhaps a carpenter or a woodworker, but you could be an artisan with, with uh, iron or with brass or with many other uh, objects. So uh, Jesus was, in the New Testament, Matthew 13, 55, literally he was called a tecton. Now, for a long time, the word technology in our language simply meant a branch of knowledge. So you see this in the titles of universities. A technical university is where you not only study the arts and sciences, but you study the practical application of, of, of science. And so that, that branch of, uh, of learning that's concerned with uh, the practical application of science is called technology. But only since 1898 did we develop the notion of technology as the tool itself. Like, we need some new technology in this classroom. You couldn't have said that in 1700. People wouldn't have known what you meant. It's, it's, it's really evolved in our thinking. So I really want us to think about technology today in, in the sense of any kind of equipment or tool or device that is the product of art and of craft for some purpose. And so it may be a computer, a smartphone, a DVD player, but it may be a number two pencil. Paper is one of the most brilliant technological inventions in the history of humankind. If you're an average American, you will use this year about 500 pounds of paper. That's the average in the US. And it's gone down only slightly in, in recent years since the invention of the computer. And in, unfortunately, in many offices, with the addition of computers, paper usage has gone up. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. My second point is we all need to be multi-technical. If everyone is using technology anyway, if we take that as a given, 
then the question is not whether, but which one, and when, and why, and how. Uh, new technologies are fascinating because they have disparate effects on a community, uh, in our case, a learning community. Some technologies have the power to disrupt and to displace old technologies. Uh, we could all probably name some examples. The most obvious that comes to my mind are recording devices. In my own lifetime, we've gone a long way, you know, from vinyl records to small cassettes to CDs and on and on you go to the, the multiple digital formats now for recorded sound. Uh, and, and this is an example for me of where one technology truly disrupts and displaces another technology. But you can also think of many forms of technology that when the new one comes on board, the old one doesn't go away. In fact, it has the strange ability to help us clarify a better understanding of what the old technology was for. Instead of removing it, it simply clarifies its place or function. Uh, I happen to have a, a satellite radio in my car. I love radio. There's no way radio is going to be replaced. Many, year, many years ago, people thought television would, and would destroy radio. That's, that just seems absurd now. Because now we understand that radio is for something that's really very good that that a, a TV cannot do. And so here we, are, here we have an example of side-by-side -side technologies. Uh, one of my favorite examples is a great American novelist. Um, a few years ago, he wrote an, an article uh, in uh, the uh, Library of Congress magazine about writers. And he went out and looked at how writers write, uh, great writers in, in the, sort of the Western canon and looked at the records of how they write. And, and, uh, but then he tells the story of how he writes. And it turns out in his house, uh, he had three desks. Uh, one desk was for routine matters like mail and phone, a kind of necessary kind of, uh, of uh, thinking, perhaps. And on that desk, he had an Olivetti typewriter. And then he had a desk with a computer. He was into word processing, uh, and uh, he would produce final drafts. He would do some composing at uh, the computer. But then the third desk had only paper and a number two pencil. And so here's one of America's greatest writers who had three different desks. And he said each desk served a different side of himself. And he called one the man of the world, the guy who answers the phone, who takes care of correspondence, and maybe pays a bill. The functioning professional there, you know, at the computer. It's where I spend much of my life. But then the third is the place, he said, for the tender, tentative creator. When he wanted to be at his most creative place, for him, it was paper and a number two pencil. Uh, this gave me great comfort when I read about how Updike does it. Now, I'm not a great you know, Pulitzer Prize winning writer. I don't think that'll ever happen. But I understand what he's saying there, that uh, we have different places within us that need different kinds of nourishment and different kinds of support for different purposes. And I would say your students do too. And so I would encourage you to resist the uh, one size fits all. Um, According to Dale Mann, instructional technology works. Instructional technology only works for some students in some topics under some conditions, but that, but that is true of all pedagogy, all systems for teaching or learning. There is nothing that works for every purpose, for every learner, all the time. So I guess I'm cautioning you against being too formulaic here. And I'll say more about that uh, in a moment. How many selves do you have? Does your technical expertise allow you to switch tools accordingly? Your students also have different selves. Do your tools line up with the variety that your students need? So I'm asking you to be multi -tech. Number three, treat technology as the servant, not the master. You as the faculty member must be in the driver's seat. It's just a tool. 
you know, I have a car that I drove up here. I love my car. It's an int- It now says that I'm about to back into a tree. I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I'm still the driver. And, you know, sometimes I don't want to drive my car. I can drive down to Legacy Park, and I want to walk in the park. Sometimes walking is better than driving. It is not Luddite to want to walk. <laughs> Again, it's a matter of time and place. Uh, I know I'm not a Luddite because I have an iPad, an iPhone, and a laptop, etc., and I use them daily. I'm amazed at what they can do for me. But sometimes I have to stop and reflect on what they cannot do for me. And what bothers me a lot about technology talk today is people always kind of get into that golly gee whiz moment about all the gadgets. And I do this with apps. You know, I learn about a new app and I get so excited and I become an evangelist for the latest app. But you almost never hear anybody talk about what technology can't do or what it displaces. And that's the, the hidden dark side here that we need to be aware of. We need to understand that we sometimes need to turn our machinery off. There's an off button on your machinery, and that is an important device. We had a presentation at Seaver College just a few years ago. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, You got the lesson, congratulations. Uh, We had a presentation on effective use of PowerPoint at Seaver three or four years ago, and one of the most important points I heard was there is a B on the keyboard for blacking out the screen. Use it. I've been bored to death by a PowerPoint presentation because one screen stayed up there forever you know, and you got the point, and it just stays there. And uh, you know what that does to the student? It distracts them. They, they, they're not going to look at you as long as there's a screen there, but the, big, but the screen is boring. So maybe the best thing you learned today is to use the B key. <laughs> uh, by the way, there's a kind of a philo- philosophy behind that. We live in a very uh, mysterious world where there is chiaroscuro, light and, sh- and, and shadow, and it's the light and the shadow that produces art. In music, you can't have music if you don't have silence. If you don't have pauses between the notes, you can't really have music. Music is predicated upon silence. And I would say technology works best when it's punctuated with its absence. Uh, Number four, be selective and integrated. Not every musician plays every instrument in the orchestra, Play the instrument that makes the kind of music you want to make. It's the very difference that creates the harmony. Um, This was a very thoughtful uh, comment from a a, a recent study of learning technology. (coughs) They say uh, researchers have noted that technology had an enduring positive impact on student engagement only under certain conditions, particularly when the technology was integrated into other aspects of the student's experience. For example, students were less likely to become bored with computers when teachers used technology as one tool among many in their instructional repertoire. In such classrooms, teachers used computers only when they were the most appropriate tool for completing the assignment, not simply because they were available. Number five, be comfortable with the unknown. I know how busy you are, and I also know how what a time hog uh, playing with uh, technology can be and using it. Uh, you can perfectly well every time, and you know that because you're looking at my PowerPoint that I did over the weekend. Someone has said sometimes you have to build a bridge while you walk across it, and I think we need to be comfortable with that, being somewhat provisional as we go. Um, I also love uh, the great comment by Yvonne Chouinard, who is that great outdoorsman and environmentalist who founded the Patagonia Clothing Company. He said, adventure is the uncertainty of outcome. So uh, I guess I'm inviting you to be a little comfortable with uh, the fact that you may be doing some things about which you cannot be certain. It's one of the problems with our assessment model, isn't it? It It presupposes that you know what the outcome should be. Where is the room or the space to not know yourself? because you're on an adventure with your students in discovery. Uh, Well, we just have to kind of live with that tension. Number six, (coughs) share your challenges. Uh, Here I'm preaching to the choir because you've come to share uh, with one another, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I hope, though, that you will resist the popular notion that if you try a new technology, then you have to be successful with it. There's a a vague and somewhat, (coughs) I think, insidious 
notion that we have to prove we're successful. We, we are very committed to success. Uh, but if you think about other experiments in the world, when, when do you demand 100% success with any other experimental uh, regimen? Um, can see the messiness of the fact that we're teaching human beings, not robots, uh, that students are highly complex, and that there are, is a mountain of variables that go into the teaching moment, and we cannot possibly measure for all of them. It seems I'm just asking us to be honest about that, tell the truth <laughs> about our achievements and uh, our results, whatever they may be. And number seven, recognize the limits. Uh, let's talk about the limits of technology as well as its virtues. This is really true. A friend of mine brought me a book a few years ago, a book-length study of the virtue and the power of the overhead projector and how that it would revolutionize education. It came out in the 60s. A whole book on the wonders of the overhead projector. Now, I sort of belong to the overhead projector era. I started teaching that long ago. And it was a wonderful tool. I don't want to knock it. Uh, I still have a few of those acetate sheets in my folders. I don't know what to do with them, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact is it did some good. But the hype over the overhead projector is today comical, isn't it? Uh, will someone look back on our day and, and ask the question? We'd, I would love a conversation, and this isn't the time or the place, about the shadow side of, of technology. I, I see a kind of a union uh, duality here. You know, there's the golden side and then the dark shadow side. And I would do a whole lesson on just email alone. I live by email. I could not possibly get my work done without email. But I must tell you, a lot of the work I do today is to undo the damage of email. And we hardly ever talk about it. It does tremendous damage on this campus. Inappropriate emails, unhelpful emails, emails that complicate and confuse. Um, and so here's just, just one example of a wonderful tool. It's like using a hammer, you know, to do brain surgery or something. It's just often misused. Uh, laptops in the classroom are often misused. I know teachers who think a wonderful thing's happening because they have all the students on laptops. Meanwhile, students all over that class are shopping eBay or doing uh, Facebook or whatever. That tells me, in that case, that the laptop has become the enemy and you have become complicit with the enemy if you do not control the use of that wonderful tool. Uh, I have the feeling that if Solomon were living today, or he was, who wrote Ecclesiastes, he would say something like this, for everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to email, and a time to, fa to talk face to face, a time to surf, and a time to go play in a surf. Number eight, uh, watch the audience. It's watching you. Now, in uh, rhetorical theory today, one whole mode of understanding text is to do what we now call reader response or reception theory. And the whole idea is that a text is not on the page. The text is whatever it comes to mean in the mind of the reader. In fact, literally, all I have here are black marks. I just have ink marks on white paper. That's all that's there. And only until those symbols are turned into meaning do you have a text. Uh, and so the uh, reception of the text becomes the focus of attention. And any communicator knows, and you know this as a teacher, that uh, if you're not watching what's happening to the students, if you're blathering on uh, but uh, it's not being received, uh, then uh, there is a problem in the communication. Uh, I think that complicates this problem of reception because it often displaces the human and the personal. I don't know if any of you in this room are on the, our mail order system for getting medicines, uh, but I'm being driven crazy by these phone calls. I get daily saying, do this, do that, you know, and you, uh, uh, it's, it's just, it disrupts my life. And yet they're trying to be, they have no sense of how their messages are being received. They think they're doing me a service and I feel like it's a disservice. I wonder if sometimes that's the, what happens to us when we teach. Um, 
learning is more than the transfer of information from one brain to another. Uh, it's, uh, it's got to be watched very carefully. Uh, have you ever noticed, for example, how students can go almost instantly passive when you put a movie up? Now think about it. If they've been going to movies their whole lives and they, there's this kind of popcorn mentality, you know, whether they literally kick their shoes off and stretch back you know, in the easy chair, mentally that's what they're doing. And so while you're trying to give them this, this multimedia experience, many of them are going passive almost instantly unless you in some way engage them around the video before and after that makes them an active viewer and not a passive viewer. So I think of uh, Oscar Wilde. Could we go back to that? Did we move ahead here? Watch the audience because it's watching you. I love this quote from Oscar Wilde. The play was a great success, but the audience was a disaster. <laughs> a few of us have had that experience. I may be having it right now. I don't know. <laughs> uh, human. Uh, I've said that the best learning is personal heart-to-heart -heart and not just brain-to-brain. -brain. And we all know that in our heart of hearts, and we need to figure out how the technology aids and advances that. And finally, uh, keep it creative. I started with the point that at the root word of technology, we have art and invention. Technology in Greek means skillful, artistic, done by the rules of art. So enjoy the pleasure of discovery uh, beyond the rote and the formulaic. And please leave room for serendipity, the unknown, the mysterious, the yet undiscovered. If education isn't an adventure for our students, uh, we are failing them. Remember John Updike and his three desks. Uh, I don't have the luxury of three desks, but at home I actually have different parts of the house where I, w I have different projects. If, if I'm reading a certain kind of material, I have one chair. If I'm doing work of another kind, I'm at a desk. Um, I hope we can be like uh, Updike who said, uh, the refusal to rest to risk excess on behalf of one's obsessions is what makes some artists, and I would say teachers, adventurers, on behalf of us all. Well, I hope that uh, something in my list of 10 thoughts about technology will stimulate you. Maybe it will stimulate you to give me the list I should have worked today, and I'd be wel I would welcome them, even in an email, uh, what you think about uh, technology and learning. I do think that just like the you too can be a tech star just like them, our technology all-stars that are being featured in last uh, August magazine. I hope you enjoy the venture today and throughout the year, and uh, thank you for uh, being here, and have a great conference. Thank you, Provost Tippins, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have a 10-minute break, and then if you are returning uh, to see Professor Helm in this room, at 9.25, please come back. Otherwise, Professors Lucas and Fisher will be in the blue room. Thank you very much.